Welcome to the Avantas Raman webinar. Raman spectroscopy, the solution for product identification in chemistry and pharmaceutical industry. Before we start, we would like to tell you something about the logistics by using the webinar. On the screen you will see the control panel. All attendees are muted, so you are not able to respond by voice. If you have questions, please use the chat box. Questions will be answered at the end of the session. The webinar will be divided in two parts. After this short introduction, we will go to the first part of the webinar, presented by Peter de Painter from Vibespec. In the second part, we will present solutions Avantas can provide. This part will be presented by Gerloop of Avantas. At the end, there will be a session to answer questions entered in the chat box during the webinar. We will now go to the part presented by Peter de Painter. Thank you for the introduction, Ger, and I will start this session uh, with discussion on vibrational spectroscopy and in particular Raman spectroscopy. As we should know, we are working with light, which is an electromagnetic radiation and has to be dealt with as a wave phenomenon. Each wavelength has a particular frequency and an electrical field alternating from negative to positive. The wavelength is related to this frequency by the correlation to the speed of the light C. So if we take a look at the electromagnetic radiation spectrum, we can of course see the UV vis part of the spectrum which is largely uh, visible to our human eye. This goes from 200 to about 800 nanometer, which corresponds to about 50,000 to 12,500 wave numbers, which is the unit that normally vibrational spectroscopists use for their work. So one of the regions which is close to the visible region is the near infrared. It is rather arbitrary, but it is scheduled from 800 to 2500 nanometers or 12,500 to 4,000 wave numbers. And a very interesting part is the mid-infrared region, which goes from 2500 to 25,000 nanometers, which corresponds to 4,000 to 400 wave number resolution. In the mid-infrared, and that is an intrinsic property of the molecules, most of the bindings, so the molecular connections, have their frequencies in that range. So this is the fundamental region of molecular vibrations. And you could see that as two atoms connected by a spring, and the spring is constantly moving from the up situation, so the extreme situation, to the lower situation, which is the extreme compression situation. And the frequency that is used by these molecules is in the order of 10 to the power 13 vibrations per second, which is very fast, of course. If we look at a molecule, and if we look at a very simple molecule, so a diatomic system, then this tells us, so this figure on the left, you can see that the ground state, there is still some energy, which means that at every moment in time, as long as there is a bond between atoms, there will be a vibration. And this vibration, as we can see from the scheme, can go to another level, but only in one way, which means that it goes quantized. So it means that there is a certain amount of energy necessary to go from the ground state to the first vibrational level. And of course, if it's in the first vibrational level, it can go to the second vibrational level. But that has the same energy transition, and it's not allowed to go from the ground state to the second state. So the, these are 
the really fundamental vibrations of a molecule. And for the frequency, we can have the following equation, and it tells us that the frequency in wave number is uh, related to the force constant, so the strength of the bond between the atoms, and the reduced mass, which has to do with the weight of the atoms involved in the vibration. And the rest is constant. So what we see, will see in a vibrational spectrum, is the ratio between the force constant and the reduced mass. So if we look at a very typical vibration, which is a C double O stretching vibration, then we can see that this vibration has a typical frequency of about 1720 wave number. So we can see in the Raman spectrum, which is presented on the right, that there will show, you will be able to see a peak corresponding to this vibrational frequency. But what is Raman scatter? Well, most of the light that we will have in Raman scatter experiments will be Rayleigh scattering, elastic scattering, which has exactly the same wavelength of the excitation of the laser. Which means that if we come and excite our molecules with a green laser, then most of the light will be green. So no information will be in that Rayleigh scatter. We start with green and we end up with green. But 1 in 10 to the 7th, so 1 in 10 million photons, sometimes gives you inelastic scatter. And this inelastic scatter means that some energy is transferred from the light to the sample. And this is only possible if the vibrations pick up or lose, give rise to a loose of energy from the light. So if you look at this picture, then you see 1 in 10 million photons will give a different color. And that will be the interesting photon for our experiments in Raman. So if you look at it in a Raman term scheme, we have our laser, and it doesn't matter which frequency we use, but in this case I will show you an example with 532 nanometers, which corresponds to almost 19,000 wave numbers. And we have this excitation wavelength, and we excite our molecules to a virtual level. And then if it falls down from the virtual level to the ground state, then we have Rayleigh scattering. So no energy transferred. But sometimes we have lost some energy. So the wavelength will be slightly larger. And that's what we call Stokes radiation. And in some cases, cases, the molecules are already in the first vibrational excited state. And then they go to another virtual level. And then they can fall back to the ground state. And then you have gained some energy. And that's what we call anti-stokes. But as you can assume, this is much less likely to happen than the other part. So the Stokes radiation is what we normally see with Raman experiments. So if we compare this with the well-known vibrational technique infrared spectroscopy, you look at the absorption process from the ground state to the first vibrational level. And that's the frequency at, for instance, 1000 wave number. And if we now compare that with the Raman energy, so if we look at the Stokes frequency, then that should give a Raman shift of exactly the same frequency as we should have observed in the, in the infrared spectrum. So, which means that the radiation became a longer wavelength, so 562 instead of 532, and you go to a lower frequency, so you lose energy in the order of about 18,000 wave numbers, which corresponds to a Raman shift of 1,000 wave numbers, which should be exactly the same as what we, have, we should have seen in the infrared absorption spectrum. So, this makes it possible to study mid-infrared absorptions but with visible light by using lasers with Raman spectroscopy. So if we look now at another laser line, so we would... Well, first I should tell that we also have the near infrared, where we look at overtones, which are in principle forbidden transitions, but they can happen because there are some anharmonic models instead of only harmonic models. 
we will not focus on that today. So if we use a different laser, so 785 nanometers, we can have exactly the same process. We go to a virtual level, which is of course a different level, but it's virtual. And then we fall back with a longer wavelength than that 785. So for instance, for the same vibration, we now go to 852 nanometers and a, still the same Raman shift of thousand wave numbers. So corresponding with the same infrared vibration. So schematically depicted over here, you see the excitation wavelength around 500 nanometers. We have our stoke region where the wavelength is longer and the anti-stoke region where the wavelength is shorter. What does that mean? Well, in an, in, from an instrumental perspective, if you use a 532 nanometer laser, you see that your complete Raman spectrum, if you would like to collect that from 0 to 4000 wave numbers, because that's the mid-infrared region where all the fundamental vibrations take place, then you have to have a range in the order of 140 nanometers for the green laser situation. And if you have the red laser situation, you need much more. So the range of your detector, etc., should be much more sensitive for a larger wavelength range than with the 532 laser. If we look at some vibrational spectra, you can see that the near-infrared spectrum of polystyrene is depicted in blue over here. The mid-infrared spectrum in black and the red is the Raman spectrum. These all relate to the same fundamental transitions and their overtones. So these are three vibrational spectra which are highly correlated. But we see large differences especially if we focus on the mid-infrared and the Raman spectrum of polystyrene in this case, we can see that the spectra are very different. So we look at exactly the same vibrational energies, but the selection rule makes it very different for mid-infrared and for Raman. The mid-infrared spectrum is more sensitive or more, uh, shows you more bands that are due to the dipole moment change during a vibration whereas the Raman spectrum shows more intensity where you have a high polarizability of the vibrational modes. So you see that these spectra are complementary, but still they look in the same region of the fundamental modes of your molecules. And for comparison here you see a cellulose spectrum which has a very large intensity bands for the OH stretching region for instance, so a very strong band in the infrared, whereas that peak in the Raman spectrum is much weaker due to the difference in selection rule. So the same vibrational frequencies but with different intensities. So now if we look at an experimental setup, what you need is a spectrometer. And of course one of the major issues with Raman spectroscopy is that the number of Raman photons is much smaller than the number of photons from Rayleigh scattering. So we have a lot of green photons if we start with 532 and now we have to get rid of this Rayleigh scattering because that of course overwhelms the signal that we are interested in. So what comes back from the sample we have to filter so to get rid of that Rayleigh wavelength. And then the longer wavelength will be detected in the spectrometer and for each frequency we will then see an intensity which gives us the Raman spectrum. And the nice thing of Raman, which is a major advantage above infrared spectroscopy, that you can measure the same fundamental vibrations, but now behind glass, because it's a very strong infrared absorber, but for visible light, of course, it's transparent. So one of the applications that I would like to show, and to show you the power of Raman spectroscopy, is in this case one of uh, subjects I've been working on, and then you see that it's a lens for a DVD player which is a glass body coated with some polymer and the polymer is UV cured on top of it, that glass body. And if you would like to measure during the process what happens with your reaction 
Then you have to measure in the mold. So you apply photopolymer on top of the lens body and then you press the lens mold to form a certain shape in that lens top coat of the UV polymer and you would like to measure during this curing. And of course then you can only do that with a technique that can go and see through glass. And there's Raman very suitable for. So we could use FT infrared to monitor this reaction offline, but we can also look in situ the polymerization using Raman. So if you look at this molecule, you see some reactive groups on the end, and this double bond will disappear during the curing. So now we can look at the Raman spectra. The black one is before the UV curing, and the red one is after the UV curing. And you see very nicely that some of the peaks of that functional group of the acrylate will disappear during the reaction. And one of them is, of course, the C double C stretching vibration, and you will see that that decreases during the reaction. And another one is the change of the C double O intensity during this reaction. So a very nice tool to monitor how far is my reaction and how fast is it going. And you can do that even in very short time. So you can do that with time resolved spectroscopy. So within seconds, because these reactions are pretty fast, we can measure with Raman behind a rather thick glass body the Raman spectrum. And in that sense, we can measure the conversion during this curing process. And you see that the time is in the order of seconds to record spectra. And another thing is that you can do it in situ behind glass for, for instance, a paintable display. Of course, for these type of measurements, you need a RAM microscope. But in that case, you can use a RAM confocal setup to measure with depth resolutions in the order of microns. So in this case, we have a functional liquid crystal layer, which determines the uh, performance of a display later on. And we have some layers around it to fill or to make that pixel. And in this case we can measure the functional layer without opening the device and even during operation if we would like to. So we did some measurements for these kind of mixtures. So we have an LC material which is a highly aromatic system with a C triple N connected to it. And we have some reactive molecules again. Again, you see an acrylate group, and also for this molecule, an acrylate group, so the EBOMA and the steel bean will perform a curing reaction during the production process. And now we can see that Raman has a very nice pattern and that they differ largely for different chemical compounds. So we can see for the red spectrum, which belongs to the K15 sample, which shows a very nice peak around 2200 for the C triple M and some very strong bands for the aromatic system. And also the green spectrum, which is very distinct peaks from the other spectrum, we can discriminate all these different compounds within the mixture by using Raman spectroscopy. Of course, if peaks overlap, we sometimes need some more advanced techniques like chemometrics or principal component analysis or classical least squares analysis to do these, uh, to follow these kind of reactions. There you see the C triple C, the C double C, the C single C and the CH. So every region has some specific strength of the bond. For instance, for the C triple C it's a stronger bond, so a higher frequency than the C single C. And of course the CH stretching vibrations, because the hydrogen is very light, we will always see that in the higher frequency region. So now we are able, without opening this display, to measure where are my materials and can I highlight, so if you see the colors, if it's red, there is a lot of the K15 in this picture. And in this case, if it's red, there is a lot of steel beam, and in this case, a lot of iboma, so the lower picture. So it makes it possible to measure chemical information through glass in a closed system without any introduction of errors by sampling. 
And also you can vary the temperature and then you can see that the material really behaves in a different way. So if you decrease the temperature from 45 degrees, where you see here the liquid crystalline material in yellow, it will gather together in the center and form a droplet at room temperature. So that's very interesting information on a display without opening. And it's also suitable for semi or even real quantitative analysis. So your Raman spectrum can give you quantitative information on your materials. So if we look at a mixture in this case of a polymer which consists of polyethylene terephthalate, so the above structure, a very common plastic, we can add something to that to change the physical properties. So if we look at the molecule IPA, which is for isophthalic acid, you see that the only difference is with the above structure that there is a substitution pattern difference because we now have one tree substitution of the aromatic ring instead of one four substitution. So if we now record the Raman spectra, and I think we should all expect that these spectra will be very similar whether there is more or less IPAR present because they are very similar products in chemical nature. But that's also a very powerful thing of vibrational spectroscopy, even if it's only a difference due to a substitution or isomerization, you can still see differences in the vibrational spectra. So if we zoom in, in these spectra, which are about 10 spectra of different concentrations, it looks like very similar spectra, but if we zoom in in certain regions, and especially in the region of thousand wave numbers, we can see a very strong difference showing up and which is correlated to the difference in the substitution pattern of that aromatic ring. So we can even make a quantitative model using PLS, partial least squares regression, and predict the concentration of the isophthalic acid with an error smaller than 1% and it can be even optimized but still we can really nicely predict the concentration of one very similar chemical compound in one another. So yes we can use Raman spectroscopy for quantitative purposes. And for semi-quantitative results, so this is a part of work in the field of catalysis where there are formed many many different types of complexes if you change for instance the pH of a reaction mechanism or a reaction mixture. So if we have this phosphate type of molecules in presence of catalysis we can see differences due to different pH because molecules will form different complexes. And this all happens in water and that's also a very strong point of Raman spectroscopy. You can measure reactions in water. So if you look on the left we have the different spectra and these are spectra which are changing due to different pH. So we go from for instance a pH of only 1 or 2 to a pH of 10 or 12 and then you will see changes in the Raman spectra due to changes in molecular structure. If you do this with, for instance, a chemometric method, method like uh, multivariate curve resolution, you can extract the spectra of the different species that are present, which can help you to find out what happens and what kind of transition products do I have during the reaction. And you can follow the different compounds. So here you see a concentration profile for four different species in this reaction mechanism. So this is, this is not a very quantitative way, but it is at least a semi-quantitative way to follow your products in water in very complex systems. Another thing you can do is classification and get structural information with Raman spectroscopy. So we worked on a counterfeit medicine uh, called Lipitor, which is uh, Try, they try to lower your cholesterol with these kind of medicines. And one of the products in this picture was false, so a counterfeit. But even from the package it's very difficult to tell, but also from the tablet and everything else it's very difficult to tell which is the false product. 
and I even can't remember it's the left or the right, but sometimes the packages of the counterfeits are even nicer than the original pack package. So then techniques like vibrational spectroscopy can help you out to find out which one is the real genuine product and which one is counterfeit. If you do this with near-infrared spectroscopy, you can see that these spectra are rather broad bands with some small features and still you can see the differences, but it's very difficult to interpret because in the near-infrared we look at a lot of different combination bands. So the assignment of what we are seeing is very difficult. But still we can make classification models to discriminate between the false and the good products. But if you use Raman spectroscopy, it's a different story. Because then if you look at the active ingredient, so the active pharmaceutical ingredient, the AP, API, you can really see big differences between the genuine product and the counterfeit. So the top spectrum is of the real active ingredient and the lower spectrum is of the counterfeit. You can see a lot of differences in these spectra, so you see also bands that you can assign, so you can even find out what kind of product they use in the counterfeit medicine. And that's a very powerful property of Raman spectroscopy. You get a lot of structural information and you immediately can see that there is a big difference in the active compounds in the counterfeit and the real model. So if you use these spectra of counterfeit and real uh, samples, real tablets, then you can easily build principal component models or partial least squares, discriminant analysis models that can discriminate between the different types of medicine. And you can also see that it's really related to the bands that are involved. So the real aromatic systems on the left have really different characteristics in the spectrum than the non-aromatic bonds in the right. So very useful and fast discriminating tool for false medicines. And another thing that Raman is very good at is discriminating bet between different types of carbon. So you have all these kind of uh, diamond-like carbons, silicon dope diamond-like carbons, diamond and the highly ordered graphite samples. And you see that each type of uh, material has a very distinct Raman spectrum. And it tells you that you can measure carbon spectra or spectra of carbon material and discriminate between the different types of carbon, which is very difficult with any other analytical technique and even sometimes impossible. Furthermore, you can see things like differences in stress in silicon. I should say that you need a very high resolution instrument for these kind of measurements, because if you see on the left, you see that the difference in wave number shift is only one wave number that is plotted on the left picture. So this means that you have to be very good in discriminating a peak at 520 or 522 or 523. So that means that you need high resolution equipment but then you can really measure different kinds of stress in your silicon samples. Very interesting, of course, for the semiconductor industry. So then I would like to conclude with some uh, remarks on RAM. I think it's a very versatile, fast and a relatively cheap analytical technique. It consists of chemical as well as physical information. It's easy applicable in most of the case, uh, cases and virtually no sample preparation is needed. However, not always it's non-destructive because you can imagine that if you use a laser for your excitation, you can put so much energy in that your sample will burn. And one of the major issues can be fluorescence so that you can get close to a transition which is a real electronic transition and then you will be overwhelmed with a much more efficient process of fluorescence, but one of the solutions is taking a longer excitation wavelength, so instead of 532 you will use 785 or even longer to overcome this effect. The nice thing is that now fundamental vibrations which are taking place in the mid-infrared energy region can be visualized using a visible light source. 
So now you can use glass containers and optics, so like fibers. Furthermore, Raven can be used as a quantitative and a qualitative tool. And hereby I would like to end my presentation, but not before thanking some colleagues who have been working on these subjects at Philips or in Manken Inge Forstenbos. Thank you, Peter, for this interesting part in, in that uh, presentation of Roman technology. The second part of this webinar, we will have a close look at what is possible within Avantis to provide you a solution. As you have seen so far, Roman is a very interesting technique and it can enable a lot of things and gives you fingerprints of materials to make good analysis. To measure Roman, you will need a Roman system, a Roman measurement system. Such a system will consist of several parts, as illustrated on this sheet. As one can see, one will need a laser to excitate, as Peter mentioned, with mostly with 532 or 785 nanometer wavelength. You will need a probe to bring the light to the sample and catch a reflected light from the sample. And of course, a spectrometer to ana analyze the signal and of course, software to process the data from the spectrometer into useful user information. In the following sheet, we will describe these parts more detailed. First, there is the laser. The laser is used to excitate the sample. Typical laser powers are in the range of 10, 10 to 500 milliwatts, and preferably it will be adjustable. Also required is a high resolution laser with no mode hopping, and as I already mentioned, for one we commonly use 532 or 785 nanometers. The benefit of 532 is that there is much energy in the sample, but there is a chance on luminescence or fluorescence. This will not be present with a 785 laser. When one uses a 532 nanometer green laser, there are pros and cons. On the pro side, the plus points, there are five times strong aroman scattering, so you need lower power levels. There's also a benefit that this green laser is in the visible range, so it's easy to see. And you are aware that there is something with laser power, so you can be easily scared off. It can induce luminescent reactions, which can be a diagnostic for material. And the CCDs used in the spectrometers are much more sensitive for this wavelength range than in the, in the IR range. But there's also a downside to using this kind of lasers. It may burn some organic and dark materials. And luminescence may mask Roman scattering totally or partially. The 785 nanometer lasers also has some pros and cons, of course. And the pro is of that it is uh, reduced luminescent reactions. So, but the, ben, the drawback is that it is a weaker Roman scattering. So we need a more powerful laser. And a more powerful laser is a more dangerous laser. And also the fact that the light is less visible for the human eye makes it even more dangerous. And as a last drawback, there is that the CCDs are less sensitive in that range. The next part in this Roman measurement system was a Roman probe. In this sheet you will see how the Roman probe works. The probe has two functions. The first function is to bring light to the sample. And the second function is to catch light reflected by the sample and guide it to the spectrometer. Preferably, this signal needs to be as clean as possible. So you want to get rid of the light from the laser. That's why there is a notch filter inside to filter this information out.
Then the light is guided to the spectrometer. When we take a closer look to the spectrometer, there are a couple of requirements important for a good Roman spectrometer. These requirements are listed here, so, and these are high resolution, good sensitivity, preferably configurable. We have cooled and uncooled versions, so if you need long integration times, a cooled version is a pro. A pro. And we would like to have no moving parts, so that the wavelength is accurate over time. Here you see the inside of such a spectrometer. We at Avantis use a symmetrical journey turning design. A great benefit of this design is that it gives, provides you with a high resolution. When the spectrometer has taken the signal, it will be guided to the PC for analysis and the software will transfer the data coming from the spectrometer into useful user information. So it will convert first of all the raw signal to a nanometer signal or spectrum expressed in either nanometers or in wavelength. Avantis offers different kind of models in Roman systems and it's all depending on the application you want to fulfill. So we have different models with different lasers, 532, 782, cooled and uncooled versions. And nowadays we also have a supreme version which gives you very high performance. Of course, to every system there is a certain price tag. So you can choose the right system for your application with the right price performance relation. Avantas recently renewed the existing Roman system and added some new models to its slide. In all the systems we use the 2048L detector. This gives you a better signal to noise compared to the previous detector we used. Also we greatly improved the cooling on it so we are now able to uh, take spectra up to 600 seconds integration times. Previously this was 200 seconds. The higher detector gives you more sensitivity and we accommodated our probes to it so that we use with 400 micron fibers to get a good match to the detector. The new stage cooling provides better performance. It can be accurate to 0.1 degrees which gives you good results in the end in your Roman spectrum. And cooling is an important factor because it reduces the dark current of the detector. In the new series of Roman systems, we call it the Roman Supreme, we also use this detector. But the performance of this system is much higher due to a virtual high throughput slit. Due to the use of this virtual high throughput slit, we have a system improvement of five to seven times compared to the normal system. Also this system comes in a cooled and an uncooled version. To illustrate the performance improvements of the Supreme in comparison to the standard system, we show some measurements. One on ethanol and one on PTFE. Perhaps you know the PTFE stands for polytetrafluoroethylene, also known as Teflon. In these graphs you clearly see that the Supreme has a 6 to 7 time better performance. Some reasons why Roman is such an interesting and upcoming technique. Peter already mentioned it, sample preparation is not required, fingerprint of a spectrum is given, and this non-destructive and non-contact method can be used for solids and liquids and water and glass does not interfere. So you can measure through glass containers. The following sheets will give you some insight in what fields Roman technology is already successfully used. There is for instance gemology, so a 
can be used for identification of diamonds. It can be used in public safety and security, so for explosive detections on TNT, chlorate, cyclonite, some spectrums you see in the sheet. It can be used in public safety and security to be used for identification of counterfeit drugs. We already saw an example of it. And today's law enforcement faces the challenge of identifying ever-growing number of illegal substances. It can also be used to measure on carbon nanotubes. These nanotubes are used, for instance, in rechargeable batteries. Using Romanable provides structural information as well as information on stress and the number of layers. Roman can also be used for reaction monitoring on polymerization processes. and can be used to measure various liquids and solids. And there are many more applications where you can use Roman for. So there are plastic identification, identification of, and I even don't know how to pronounce it, <laughs> plastics, forensics of art, mineralogy, characterization of links on written documents and cancer research. This brings us to the end of this second part. And in the next part we will go to the question and answer section.